mention about activism and restraint and how much the Supreme Court is demonstrating either of those particular qualities, and we'll talk more about that. We can think about the overruling of Dobbs in particular in the context of the rule of law and how it may destabilize the rule of law, and also how it affects or how Dobbs might have affected the cooperative norm of stare decisis on the Supreme Court, which is purely a uh, voluntary norm by the justices, and we might want to think about how Dobbs might affect that voluntary norm among the justices. We can think in terms of constitutional design and how the Supreme Court's, uh, how, how the, the way that we've designed the Constitution affects the power that the Supreme Court can exercise, particularly in light of a very, very difficult process of amending the Constitution, and I'll say a few more words about that. We can think about separation of powers and how the Supreme Court interacts with the elected branches uh, and the executive and, and the legislature, and also how uh, it, it, it's affected by federalism and how it affects federalism at the federal and state level. And of course, and this is inevitable in this day and time, we can think about polarization, politics, majoritarianism, whether the court is acting in a counter-majoritarian fashion, how the polarization in American politics that is being experienced today, both at the elite and at the popular uh, levels, uh, are affecting the U.S. Supreme Court, and indeed how we see polarization coming to bear on the U.S. Supreme Court itself in terms of its voting behavior. And then finally, uh, and what I will say a word about at the end here, is whether we're facing a situation where we're looking at continued retrenchment of the Supreme Court and its current trajectory, or whether or not we can hope, well, hope depending upon your ideological predisposition. And believe me, I don't <laughs> cast judgment about your ideological predisposition. You may prefer that the Supreme Court continue on its current trajectory, given your, your own attitudinal predispositions. Uh, but others may prefer that the Supreme Court shift somewhat more to the middle, and in that case, we can talk about whether there are opportunities for renewal on the Supreme Court, how we might think about cycles of history in this context. So let me just start by looking uh, a little more carefully at activism and restraint. So one way to think about activism and restraint, the way that I have thought about it, is to consider that the US Supreme Court is, of course, an unelected body, passing judgment on the decisions, the actions, the laws and enactments <coughs> of democratically elected institutions. And of course, the court has a role to play as a counter-majoritarian body to the extent that it is protecting minority rights. But we also want to think about in what context and what framework the Supreme Court should think about exercising its considerable power to invalidate acts of the legislature, acts of the executive branch, and whether there should be some guardrails placed around uh, that, that those particular powers. And one that I have found uniquely helpful in thinking about what the proper role of an unelected Supreme Judiciary is, is through uh, a footnote that was written by Chief Justice Stone in 1938 in a case called Caroline Products. And it's a very, very famous footnote, it's footnote four. And in that particular case, what, the Supreme, what, what Justice Stone said, this was post Lochner era jurisprudence, so the court turned away from invalidating New Deal legislation, as you may recall, the switch in time that saved nine happened before this. And at this point, the Supreme Court is considering, look, how should we exercise our powers to invalidate uh, legislation, both by the federal government and by states' governments? What, oh, I see, I've got, oh no, okay, never mind. I thought I, you could see my notes, but you could. Um, how, how, uh, how, how should the court go about exercising that power? And what Justice Stone recommended was that when it came to economic legislation, when it came to sort of run-of-the-mill regulation of the economy, um, that the Supreme Court should really stay its hand and stay out. Because in that kind of context, most of the time, the players in the legislative process who are interested in the outcome of that legislation have sufficient power to influence the legislation. Where the court really needed to step in and be most prominently active and activist is in situations in which the legislation that is being considered by the court or the executive actions being considered by the court or the state level actions being considered by the court are affecting and potentially discriminating against an insulated minority. And what he meant by that was insulated from the political process such that that particular minority could not affect that legislation so as to moderate its impact on them. And the, the most obvious example, of course, is Jim Crow South in which African Americans in the South uh, after Reconstruction, had no power, of course, to influence legislation. They were truly insulated from the political process. 
And thus, that would be the unique and perfect situation in which the Supreme Court should bring a very, very serious scrutiny to bear on legislation that burden that particular minority. And that's a very, very helpful way to think about the court's power because it is protecting minorities, but only in circumstances where groups cannot protect themselves through the legislative process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, right, leaving the democratic process to generate the results that we believe democracy should generate, majoritarian results out of the democratic process. So we can think about this sort of activism in terms of what is the proper role of an unelected judiciary in validating acts of our democratic branches, and then within that role, when should they be most active? And that is, of course, when we see an insulated minority um, <clears throat> that's being affected by legislation. Now, the other way to think about activism is, what is the court doing per se? And when I wrote the book, we cataloged these particular activities by the US Supreme Court. When does the court look like it's overreaching? Potentially looks, look like legislators in robes. This is the common sort of epithet that's used to describe an activist court. So when do they look like they're actually stepping over the bounds of their proper judicial role and more into a policy-making legislative role? And there are probably three you know, obvious examples of when they look like they're policy-making as opposed to judging. Uh, in accordance with law, stare decisis, and constitutional doctrine. And that is, of course, when they overturn precedent. Because overturning precedent destabilizes the law. It clearly de demonstrates a shift in the, in the justice's orientation toward the law. It looks more like policy making than when they're simply standing by existing precedent. Um, when they invalidate legislation, that's a clear expression of an unelected judiciary invalidating the outputs of the democratic process, whether that is in the federal level, the state level, or the local level, and then when they are second-guessing administrative agencies. And you might say, oh, well, administrative agencies are unelected too, and that's true, but unlike the judiciary, administrative agencies are subject to the control of an elected body or person, in the, in the body of the president in particular. So there is greater uh, democratic accountability uh, from, an, from, from an administrative agency to an elected official than there is from an une unelected court, an appointed court, that serves for life on good behavior. So that's one way to think about the institutional characteristics or the institutional behaviors that are most clearly uh, activist in nature. And then in the book what we did was we said, hey, do you really know just because a court invalidates legislation or overturns precedent, does that necessarily mean they're being activists in the way that we think of judges being policymakers in robes or legislators in robes. <coughs> and what we decided was a judge or justice would be perceived as most activist when the justice is engaging in these activities, overturning precedent, validating legislation, et cetera, but in a way that is consistently uh, uh, ideological, right? So, sorry, what happened? Can I do that? The message I wrote up there was it was overheating. Oh. <laughs> I'm giving a very good talk. Guys. That's because you're talking so good. Well, I can just go on. I mean, I can see my screen. So okay. Well, sorry, you guys can't see. Maybe it'll come. We'll try this every once in a while. Okay. Right, it's coming back again. Um. So uh. So what I had. So what I was saying was that. When the, when, the, when the justice is engaged in these behaviors, but they do it in a way that's very consistent with their own ad ideological predispositions, then it looks more activist. So, for example, you know, in the book, I just identify Justice White, Byron White, Wizard White, former football player, is among the, the least activist judges because he had an even hand when he invalidated legislation. It was not consistently in a direction that was either conservative or liberal, but mixed. When he uh, voted to overturn precedent, it was, again, very, very rare. So he engaged in these institutional activities very infrequently. But then in addition to that, he didn't do it in any predictable ideological direction. So in terms of thinking about activism, we're looking for these specific institutional behaviors. And then we're looking to see how often they're done in a way that advances the justice's uh, pre-existing attitudinal predispositions. Okay, And um, I think we're going to see that in spades uh, on the current US Supreme Court. So looking at the current court in terms of activism and restraint, what we see is an unelected court, but within a unique context, within a context of 
one might say, an ossified or sclerotic Congress. Now, I know Congress has just passed some legislation, but what Congress is not doing is it is not responding to judicial precedents with legislation to overturn them or to challenge them. And it is certainly not, and hasn't for 30 years, responding to Supreme Court precedents by way of constitutional amendments. Uh, amendment, the, uh, the uh, Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution sets forth a process to amend the Constitution that would indeed allow Congress and the state legislatures to reverse Supreme Court precedents, such as Dobbs, for example. Um, but that is such a cumbersome process. It is really, at this point, it seems to me, essentially moribund. It's not likely to be used going forward. Um, it was last used in 1992 thanks to a University of Texas student who resurrected uh, an amendment that had been uh, proposed in 1789 and was finally ratified in 1992. It's a good story if you have a chance to Google it. Um, but that's the last time it's happened. And so the Supreme Court is operating within a considerable uh, power vacuum, or at least within its own uh, insulated power structure. It is not going to be reversed by Congress in terms of statutes because Congress, again, does not propose or enact legislation to reverse the Supreme Court's statutory interpretation decisions anymore. And it is not going to be reversed by amendments. So we, we actually have a situation in which our unelected court is really at the peak, one might say, of its power. Um, given it's th the checks and balances that could be offered by other branches of government are no longer operative at the moment. Um, and in addition to that, we can think about this as an anti-Caroline court. I mentioned there was footnote four of Caroline Products that set forth a, a theory of how, one, how the court might exercise its considerable power of judicial review. But right now we see a court that is not actually exercising to protect minority rights, especially in the voting process. Um, what it is doing instead is protecting the rights, say, for example, of gun owners or the gun lobby. Um, and these particular litigants do not deserve special protection under footnote four because they have plenty of power in the legislative process. The court need not step in and protect them. They can protect themselves. And I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with me when I say that there is, you know, perhaps the most powerful lobby in the country is the gun owners lobby uh, with the NRA. And apologies. Um, and so, uh, and so, this is really an anti-Caroline court. It is really operating in a way that's orthogonal um, to what Justice Stone intended in his um, in his um, footnote. And in addition to that, I, I just want to go through sort of the six top cases from this last term, and we can think about the institutional actions that the court is taking in each one of them. And again, I'm sorry you don't have them on your screen, but first, let's start with Dobbs. That's obvious that we're dealing with a situation in which the Supreme Court overturned precedent. In doing so, destabilized um, women's um, experiences across all states and sent you know, the, the country into turmoil. Whether or not you believe in super precedents, and there is a debate sort of in the literature and among people like me and Professor Clayton about you know, whether a super precedent exists, um, this certainly would qualify if one did exist, and I'm talking about Roe versus Wade. So first, we have Dobbs overturning precedent with considerable um, impact. Second, in the case New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the Supreme Court struck down a concealed carry law regulation from New York. Um, they did so in a way that um, imposed upon the states an incredibly difficult standard uh, to apply when determining whether the Second Amendment uh, has been violated, forcing the states in every single instance of a regulation that they're considering to go back through the history and tradition of the United States to determine whether or not that particular regulation is consistent with what happened in you know, 1795 in Pennsylvania, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of um, what it was appropriate regulation at that time. Um, and so second guessing state legislatures, again, in a context in which one might argue gun owners don't really need much protection through the legislative process. In West Virginia versus EPA, the Supreme Court second-guessed uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's decision to create a uh, clean energy plan for coal industry. And the Supreme Court did so by, by uh, sort of imposing upon the government this new, or uh, fairly new, judicial doctrine called the Major Questions Doctrine, which says that if an administrative agency wants to do something that's fairly dramatic, then, and in this case, this, this action would have been, uh, that there needs to be explicit direction from Congress allowing the agency to do so, even though the statute that enabled the agency could clearly have been interpreted to allow it. So here we have the Supreme Court drawing in on uh, administrative agencies in a way that's quite intrusive and imposes upon Congress uh, the, the obligation to go back and amend the statute 
to allow for EPA to do this. And what did I just say a minute ago? Congress is not likely to do this, right? Congress is not likely to go back and actually amend the statute. So the Supreme Court is probably going to have the last word on this. Um, in addition, in Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, we had a school district, an elected body, that had determined that school prayer would not be something that it would permit on its, on its campus and at its football games because it was concerned about violating the Establishment Clause as the action of a democratically elected body in a very local context, and the Supreme Court invalidated essentially that regulation. So again, in, uh, uh, intruding upon the legislative process within the local context. And for, finally, Carson versus Macon, which was a case in which the Supreme Court required Maine to uh, include religious schools in a tuition uh, system for uh, regions within the state that could, that could not otherwise sustain a public school body. So uh, moving the ball in terms of the Establishment Clause very, very much closer to um, sort of an elimination of separation of church and state, one might argue, rather than uh, protecting the separation of church and state. And that is also an action of judicial review in validating a piece of legislation that was enacted by the Maine legislature. And I don't think really it's fair to argue, back to Caroline Products footnote four, I'm not sure you can really argue that, uh, that churches or Christians or Christian groups uh, or religious groups in general are shut out of the legislative process. So probably not a, a group of individuals who need the protection under the certain doctrinal standard or the framework established by Caroline Products footnote four. So we have a court that is intruding or injecting itself into multiple different contexts using all of the institutional tools of activism that I mentioned when you could see my slides, okay? Um, <laughs> and what I said, and I'll, I'll finish in a couple minutes because I, I, I wanna get to my sort of punchline. What I said in the book though uh, about activism is what we see here is we see in all of these opinions the rhetoric of restraint. So for example, the court will use that rhetoric, talk about originalism, as a tool for the restrainist judge. But the problem with that argument, as I was discussing this with uh, Professor Clayton last night, the problem with that argument is that it's very hard to see a situation in which originalism would drive a liberal result. So how convenient, right? This is uh, my, my I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of originalism. It's, it's a full employment opportunity act for historians. And they simply you know, are going to disagree anyway about what the history was, as you can see in the original Heller decision from 2008 with, with respect to the Second Amendment. So, um, so originalism is, is a ready-made tool if you want conservative outcomes because you're just, it's, again, I rack my brain. We were talking about this last night. I rack my brain to find a situation in which um, originalism would drive a liberal result. But I, I encourage you to help me think about that. Um, because I just can't figure it out for myself. In addition, all five of the decisions that I mentioned, sorry, sorry, six of the decisions that I mentioned, no, what did, five that I mentioned to you a minute ago, were all decided 6-3, all along predictable ideological lines. So that meets the standard for activism that I set forth in the book in 2009. We have the actions that they're undertaking are institutionally active, but they also demonstrate a clear ideological commitment in every single case. And um, so in this, in this particular circumstance, you can see it actually looks like the liberal justices are the restrainers, and that, that's something that could flip back and forth. Um, in different circumstances, they might be activists too. And of course, the Warren Court was always considered the most activist court in our history. Uh, in the study that I did in 2009, William O. Douglas was, you know, I had a chart of the justices in terms of their activism, and William O. Douglas was like out here. Um, so, you know, some justices are, liberal justices are activists too. Um, and finally, I, I, so, so meet those standards. And finally, um, the adoption of originalism on steroids, and you pretty much see it in every single one of these opinions, is, um, is a means by which the court can continue to sort of establish and retrench um, these conservative outcomes using this method that is, uh, by its very nature, as I said, unlikely to yield liberal results. Um, so <laughs> I want to just close. And so, hey, do we have? <laughs> Do we have like anything? I don't know what it's doing. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm just going to finish with the one slide, you, which you can't see, but it's a very neat slide. I'll send them to you. You can, you can have, I'll, I'll send them to the Foley Center and you guys can see the slides later. But um, so, what about the future then of the court? So, what I've described as a very activist court uh, meets all the standards uh, through the various decisions that I mentioned. Um, I suspect this is the trajectory for the court going forward. 
Uh, we can talk about what Dobbs, you know, the, the you know what Dobbs means for the future of things like gay marriage. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. What it means for the future of state constitutional rights in terms of protecting abortion and other uh, and other liberty interests that were otherwise protected by previous Supreme Courts and their precedents. But in terms of thinking about the court itself and its institutional future, um, I think it's it's worth mentioning the possibility of reform. And as you know, uh, just, uh, uh, President Biden appointed a commission on the U.S. Supreme Court who was staffed by um, what was intended to be a bipartisan group of scholars and policymakers <coughs> to talk about whether we should reform the Supreme Court's structure within the Constitution or some uh, generate some legislation that would reform the court. Um, note that uh, President Biden did not ask them to make recommendations, but merely to describe the various proposals that are set forth. And I think that says speaks volumes. Um, obviously, amending Article 3 to change the structure and nature of the Supreme Court will be just as difficult as any other amendment that we might undertake under Article 5. Um, and one thing we might do is we could pass legislation to alter the structure of the Supreme Court by keeping life tenure but creating a senior status for judges so that we can have greater turnover on the court. That's possible. And remember that um, the number nine is not sacred in the constitutional text, and we can change the size of the court whenever we want. So there may be possibilities for reform, but I think they're remote. Um, what about uh, retrenchment? Um, so and by that I mean a situation in which the current status quo of the court continues on in both the short and the medium and potentially in the long term. And I do think we need to face that uh, possibility square on for the, for the reason that the court is now suffering, as all of you know, a decline in its um, public approval rating. This is very, very worrisome for the status of the state of the rule of law of the United States. Um, as soon as the court start, starts losing the confidence of the, of the public, we start losing confidence in the rule of law, we lose confidence in its judgments and its pronouncements. And um, what is, I think, a, a very, very core institution, obviously, within our system of government um, could come to crumble uh, in, in terms of, of its status with the public. That is very, very worrisome. The other, the other uh, potential situation with respect to retrenchment is that we had you know, uh, an odd circumstance in which Congress or the Senate simply refused to consider the appointment of or the nomination of a president in, the, in, the final, in his uh, final term. Um, I found that outrageous. It demonstrates a erosion of constitutional norms and respect for the uh, coordinate branches <coughs> in a way that I think is, is a very, very uh, negative harbinger of things to come. Um, and we also have uh, a situation of 50-50, sort of very close competition within our political, between our political parties, which creates a kind of rabid dog politics, which then in turn uh, further, I think, contributes to the erosion of cooperative norms to respect for minority party um, that we're seeing in politics today. And that's all exacerbated by polarization by the big sort as we move to various places where we feel more comfortable ideologically with our neighbors. Um, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the political science literature on genetic sources of ideology, um, there have been excellent twin studies done that show that ideology is actually a genetic trait. And the more we continue to mate with people of our own ideological predisposition, the more entrenched our ideologies are going to become um, and more polarized we're going to become. So, the retrenchment story is a very worrisome one, and it, it's one that worries me constantly. Um, we're now in our 243rd year of our republic, I think, if I'm doing the math right, Cornell, 243rd <laughs> uh, Most empires only survive about 250 years. Uh, empires come to fall, yeah. Dutch, English, etc. they come to fall when internal strife opens up the opportunity for external powers to take advantage of that internal strife. And then that erodes from the inside. They lose their reserve currency status, among other characteristics, and the empire falls. We have to be very, very worried about this at the moment. The Supreme Court is playing a role um, in potentially bringing this about if we're not careful. And finally, <clears throat> and I'll stop, and then we can talk about all this stuff. Um, there, is, um, there are some theorists, and this is sort of the more optimistic side of what I just said. There are some theorists that believe that the United States goes through cycles, political cycles. Uh, and the most prominent political science uh, that, of, of these theories is called um, electoral realignment theory. Um, it was a theory that about every 30 years we have kind of a switch in the dominant party 
most obvious one is sort of from Republican domination to, um, uh, to the New Deal. Uh, in the election of FDR, there's other uh, electoral realignments that have been proposed. The problem with electoral realignment theory, though, is that we haven't seen a, really seen an electoral realignment since the 1930s that we can clearly identify as one. So that theory of electoral cycles is sort of falling apart. But there have been many other people who believe that we are simply in an oscillating you know, system of political ideology and that we oscillate between um, an expansive orientation toward government and rights and then we shift back to perhaps gener generationally to a more contractive, sort of capital-oriented as opposed to rights and labor-oriented uh, system of government, and that we're simply in one of those oscillation periods. Um, and I suppose, uh, to me, these theories are atheoretical with one exception, and that is that generations do have changing orientations to the world, and it's possible that generations respond, so for example, the 60s generation, with all of their calls for reform and agitation, uh, were responding to uh, their perhaps their parents' very, you know, buttoned up 1950s lifestyle, um, and so it could be that generationally we see a shift, and that is one source of optimism if you're unhappy with the current situation, which which I am because I'm very very worried about our democracy, um, and there's also other sources I think of optimism. Um, one of them, again, we were discussing last night, is that we see from Dobbs some interesting uh, political consequences. Um, we've seen, for example, in Kansas that women were registering ahead of men by 16 points as a result of the Dobbs decision, and no doubt because of the referendum that was proposed there to uh, overturn a Kansas, shockingly, Kansas Supreme Court decision. Who could believe it, right? <laughs> and actually found a constitutional right to choose within the Kansas Constitution. Um, and so we see these you know, these sort of glimmers of, of life um, uh, in terms of our democratic functioning. And hopefully, eventually, we'll move uh, in a direction that is back toward greater respect for our opponents in politics, um, respect for a president, for example, who chooses to nominate a justice in his or her final uh, year of office, uh, and that the Senate would give them the, the, the um, courtesy of, of a hearing. So I'm hoping that perhaps generationally we'll see a shift, but I do think that all of us at the moment, um, the Supreme Court is part of a larger trend, polarization and concern if, if, uh, in, in terms of dem democratic mm, decay, uh, and we all should be very vigilant about it. So I will, I will stop there and look forward to hearing what you think about SCOTUS. Thanks very much. We've got about 25 minutes for some uh, questions. Um, maybe I'll start us off. Yeah. Uh, there's lots, lots, lots of different issues to think about here. But let me start with uh, your fundamental point, that is the Dobbs Court is an activist court. And let me try to defend the position I think they would take, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the question of activism isn't so much whether uh, the court is agreeing with public opinion or striking down previous precedent or agreeing with legislative enactments. The question is whether or not it's adhering to the, the Constitution, right? And what the sovereign people have enacted in under the Constitution. And, and their argument is that, uh, you know, whether it leads to uh, conservative or liberal outcomes is irrelevant. There is a way to amend the Constitution. If you don't like the Constitution, you amend it. And it might be difficult, that's the way it's designed, but we can actually amend that process if we want to. So, so how do you respond to that? I mean, their argument is the role of the court is to enforce the Constitution Full stop. Yes, I think I, I, I understand what your, what your question very well. I um, I think that that uh, that would certainly be their argument. The problem, and I think the the Achilles heel to that argument, um, if you look back, let's go back to Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, Brown versus Board of Education expanded rights under the Fourteenth Amendment, um, eliminated uh, segregated schools in the South, thus you know eliminating uh, through the power of judicial review state statutes that that embodied the the will of the people in those other states. So was activists in that sense in the institutional standards I've identified. Um, but what the Supreme Court did there, which distinguishes it from the current court, is that it did it unanimously. So on that court, there were, uh, there were judges who were appointed by Republicans and by Democrats. They all could agree that this was the direction the court needed to go. And so distinguish, Brown I think is easily, easily distinguishable as, yes, perhaps an activist institutionally, but not ideologically. 
And I have two dimensions on my measure of activism. One is the institutional dimension. Are they undertaking an action that one might perceive as activist, judicial review and validating precedent? But then the second question is, are they doing it in a manner that's, that's, that furthers their ideological interests? And what we see here is clear evidence of that, because none of the liberals come along with it. And even Justice Roberts, for all his yeoman's efforts um, to try to preserve the court institutionally, um, he's failed right, to bring consensus to the court. Um, so I, I, I think you're right. There are certain circumstances where it is appropriate for the, for the court to exercise these various um, institutional behavioral sort of uh, actions. That's fine. Um, but when they seem to be doing it consistently and every time in a way that furthers the way they think government should look, the way they think policy should look, then to me, that was the test of activism mm -hmm. that was brought to the table. Now, you know, is it perfect? No. But up till now, as you know, um, very few people try to, have tried to think about activism. It's usually just uh, a, a, a critique that's thrown around yeah. at the justices. But I think it is worth, worth thinking about it uh, rigorously because the court is unelected. And how are we going to think about what the court does if we don't think about it in terms of its institutional role and what's the appropriate guardrails around that role to ensure that they do not become nine platonic guardians, which we do not want. Right. Ultimately, let's face it, it's all about one, right? It's the one justice who will ch change the case, the decision from 5-4 one way to 5-4 the other way. So really, you really don't want to be, you really don't want a king in robes or a queen. This question springs off of your answer right there, um, which laid out almost a kind of sequence uh, in which action followed by ideological assessment. <clears throat> I'm wondering if there's a third component to that um, which fits nicely into what you just said, the one person, which is a, a temporal element, which is that at some point, if an activist action, a presumptively activist action, follows very soon after mm -hmm. uh, a change in the court's makeup, say the appointment of Amy Coney Bear, which enabled X, Y, or Z to happen, um, it, it almost as if it follows from an election. So I'm wondering if, if temporality is actually a, a secondary or complementary element of assessment as, as perhaps an amplifier uh, or as a reaffirmation that but happens quickly after a change in the Supreme Court's makeup, it amplifies the possibility of, uh, of an activist. Well, I agree, and I, and I think that, thank you, Dean, I think that's the reason why um, the public is so skeptical of the Supreme Court right now, because it does seem rather, um, you know, precipitous that suddenly uh, the Supreme Court's deciding uh, a case a different way. Now, if you go back and look at uh, perhaps one of the seminal papers that has been written about the Supreme Court as national policymaker is Robert Dahl wrote a paper in 1957. I think some of the students in here are reading that paper in their graduate seminar, maybe, or an undergraduate seminar. Um, what he said was that the court uh, is rarely counter-majoritarian because uh, presidents on, on average appoint a justice every two years, and so slowly, the court will catch up to the majoritarian preferences as expressed through the election of a president and a Senate that will confirm that particular appointee uh, or nominee. And so um, the temporal element is, is another way to think about it is the flip side is that it's another, so slowly one would expect, at least that's what Dahl, Dahl hypothesized, is that the Supreme Court doesn't really ever get ahead of politics too much because it slowly catches up with the appointment process. What we have now, sadly, is a situation where only one party has been able to appoint um, uh, 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 justices. And so we don't have a balance on the court in terms of recent appointees. And that's another reason why the court has veered so dramatically uh, to the right. There's not a balance on the court. That'd be important to the court. Yeah. Um, one comment about the Brown decision, right? Like, it, that I think that's unique in that. Judge Jackson died, and John, you know, John Marshall Harlan was appointed. So that's a little bit unique, I think. But mm -hmm. um, thank God for it. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. And Brown too. Anyway, so, um, but my question about you talked about originalism in ideology, and I'm wondering what you think of the role of something like the Federalist Society, who has mm -hmm. <laughs> really kind of given this judicial interpretation to conservative ideology yes. through originalism. Right, it wasn't really a thing before the '80s not in any serious way, right? And so then you are really kind of grooming these conservative right. um, lawyers to become judges, right? And so 
Yeah, yeah and this is a great point. I think really demonstrates the power of ideas and intellectual entrepreneurialism, right? Um, one of the one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about is this doctrine that the Supreme Court is going to be considering next year, part of its Andy Caroline um, agenda, I would say, uh, which is the independent state legislature's doctrine. And that has been rejected by the court, but we see you know, a swell within the conservative legal circles of, of uh, creating justifications for this. And, uh, and this doctrine, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's based upon the word legislature in Article One and Article Two of the Constitution, in which the Constitution discusses who's gonna run federal elections, and it's the state legislatures. And um, if the Supreme Court adopts the independent state legislature doctrine, it would mean that the, in, the legislature would have complete discretion, complete free reign to do anything it wanted to do within the electoral context without review by state Supreme Courts in terms of state constitutions. And it would disallow, it would invalidate um, any uh, redistricting commissions that exist because redistricting commissions are, of course, line drawing, electoral line drawing by bodies that are not legislative. They'd be delegated by the legislature, but they're not legislative, so it would eliminate those. So that is the, this is a you know this is a brainchild. Of, I'm not exactly sure um, you know what particular lawyers, but no doubt this is a, the, the building of the justification for these doctrines ends up percolating up and into the Supreme Court. And yes, this the Federalist Society is certainly very very effective at advancing these kind of arguments for the court. Sorry, your point is well taken. I was uh, fascinated by your account of theories of patterns in American history. And uh, I was thinking about uh, two previous occasions when, when uh, there was a great deal of public skepticism about the Supreme Court. One is obviously the Dred Scott mm -hmm. decision and, and so on. And, uh, and the second that I'm aware of is the Supreme Court knocking down all the New Deal legislation in the 1930s. And it seems to me that in both cases, the action of the Supreme Court is a kind of uh, desperate rear guard defense, which was followed then by a movement very much in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And it's an affirmation of, of uh, in, in the Roosevelt case, of the government's power to regulate the economy. I wonder if this current um, activist court, and in each case, I think those were activist courts, uh, that we might see a, a similar phenomenon of, of uh, actual public opinion moving very much in a counter direction. Yeah. Uh, you're right, and that the, the terminology rear guard is actually the terminology that's used by a prominent uh, professor at Yale named Jack Falk who wrote a book called Cycles of Constitutional History. And that's the way he described what's happening now. It's just like the, the Lochner Court, just like the Dred Scott Court. Um, it's a rear guard action of protecting the previous status quo dominant, dominant uh, party coalition um, kind of uh, preferences, one might say, as it is, <clears throat> and that eventually that will peel away or that will erode and a new you know, birth of freedom, I don't know what you want to call it, um, uh, will come to bear in politics. And, and I, I think, you know, that's possible and that's the argument that's made. The, 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 the thing that worries me the most right now about that, that, and by the way, there's lots of other, so Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and Sr. had this idea that the, the Adams, John Quincy Adams and Henry Adams, believed that the os it oscillated every 12 years, the Schlesinger's every 30 years, um, Robert Putnam, who wrote um, Bowling Alone, is a new book called Upswing, and he thinks it's, it's we had polarization in the in the Gilded Age era, and then uh, high levels of polarization, and we've got it again, and we just need to do what we did in the Gilded Era to fix our problems. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of people who who advance these theories. I'm just very very worried that what what happened in both those cases was well, one we had a civil war. You know, I that that solved the Dred Scott problem, and it got us the Thirteenth Amendment. Thank God for that. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's an outcome we're looking for right now, and it's very, very worrisome, so that's not great. Um, the Lochner Court, yes, it, it, it did bow to pressure uh, from FDR, um, and Owen J. Roberts switched, switched his vote, it's true. I just, 
don't see this current court doing that because they're they're very committed to their particular agenda, perhaps even more than the Lockhart Court was. And we have this, what happened in the New Deal was that the public shifted giantly behind FDR and the New Deal, right? I mean, it was a dramatic shift of public support toward a particular uh, uh, policy, um, set of policy ideas. And, and I, we're just not gonna, I don't think in this very closely divided very polarized electorate, we're going to see that kind of shift. And so I worry that we're just going to keep inching along in this really unpleasant polarized circumstance. I could be wrong. I fear you may be right, but the, the, <laughs> the, the we demographic do forces at least are moving in the direction of a, of a new majoritarian consensus, I think. What, what did you say is doing? The demographic yeah. forces. Uh, younger voters coming in and also mm -hmm. uh, darker, darker mm -hmm. voters. Yeah, um, and that's possible. And I that's why I said generational change, yes, demographic change is, is um, will possibly shift things, let's hope. Um, just because, not because I'm particularly committed, I mean, I'm actually a moderate, I, I'm actually very moderate politically speaking in terms of policy. I just don't, I just am very, very worried that our, our, where our government is becoming seized up now Biden did enact some some important so, legislation. That, that's pretty. That is a also a little flare of hope. I think that goes up. But, um, but the more we become seized up, and the more we hate each other for uh, because we're on the other side, the more our democracy will ultimately cease to function. If I could ask a follow-up question, uh, you've, uh, you've hit on a worry. I think of most of us the way that the democratic process is seized up, it's just gridlock. And uh, one of the factors of creating that seems to be Citizens United. Would, would you have anything to say about how that might be changed without a constitutional? Well, I don't know how, it Ooh, um, I don't know, Professor Clayton might have some attitude or some, some ideas about this. I, don't, I mean, it's a constitutional decision. Um, it is, it is an anti-Caroline decision. Um, corporations don't need the help of, of the Supreme Court here at all, the political process. Um, so, um, so I don't know, I mean, I'd have to think hard. I don't know if you have any ideas about how legislation could, mm -hmm. sometimes legislation can moderate uh, constitutional decisions a court renders. Sometimes they actually can work a little bit, like there was a Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993. Part of it was struck down as unconstitutional, but it was an effort for Congress to sort of resurrect religious protections, uh, protections for religious freedoms because of a Supreme Court constitutional decision. So sometimes Congress will actually try to mold um, legislation so as to moderate um, constitutional decisions. And it may be possible that that's, you know, that maybe that's possible in the context of campaign finance, but. You could possibly go back to uh, some form of uh, public financing and create incentives that's a good point. To, to force candidates into that system. Yeah, and that, but that's the only way around it, other than a constitutional amendment or a change on the court, which I think is the most likely. The public three. finance, <laughs> so I, I agree with that. I, the, the public financing would have to be dramatic because there's so because politics is so awash in money right now yeah. um, that it's hard to see why a candidate would. Now, alternative voting methods is another thing I didn't get to mention, but Alaska is an inter interesting little siren call to uh, moderation as well. Um, kind of like what you're talking about with like politics today becoming super polarized. Um, and kind of having this whole idea where it's an us versus them, where you're voting for me just so you don't vote for them kind of uh, mm -hmm. perspective on like modern day voting. And with the court becoming like extremely young with the four most recent justices having basically half of their life left to serve, do you think there's much in way of like what the public can do to like impact the court since it seems as though senators and like current administration are just focused on passing either Democratic or Republican uh, legislature just because they don't want another party to pass their legislature? Yeah. I mean, there, 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 there is evidence uh, from a previous justice on the court that, that just, just, justices over time and as they sit on the court for a long time can moderate their attitudes. Um, you know, Blackman's the obvious example, became more liberal over time. Stevens um, yeah. became more liberal over time. He was appointed by a Republican. 
So I mean, it, it is possible, and some one of our our friends in our community of scholars has proposed that it's a Georgetown effect. They they uh, they hang out at, at parties in Georgetown and talk about politics, and then they don't want to offend their friends with their offenses. And, and in fact, uh, <laughs> one of the um, you know everyone asked me when Dobbs was coming out, well, how long is it going to take? I'm, I said it's going to take up into the minute that they uh, have an airplane ticket to leave the, 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 the city, right? Because they don't want to deal with, and that's what exactly happened. I'm sure a lot of them left to go on vacation. Um, so I, the public, public opinion, there are studies that show that public opinion affects the court. Um, whether it does it, it's hard to control for the appointment process and all that, um, but it could over time affect them. But they are, you know, People like um, Thomas have been advocating a particular, now he's all the way on the one end, but have been advocating a particular orientation toward the Constitution quite consistently for the entire time he's been on the court. And I haven't seen any change in his orientation at all. Uh, am I sorry, he had another back. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what do you think about the extremely unchecked nature of the court, seeing as we have a lot of instances, especially with the thankful uh, act of like medicine? Just prolonging the lives of justices, and it seems like they are really coasting that out until the end. They are um, sometimes to the detriment of their party. Yeah, I mean, if, if they have a party, you know what I mean. Yeah. Party, they're appointing president. And uh, thinking back to uh, the recent justices that have been appointed, again so young, often influenced by the Federalist Society, um, and most of them, if not all of them, stating during their hearings that they would not act as they have. Mm -hmm. Don't take seriously what they say here. Oh, yes, of course. But, that's, but what do you think about the nature of that seeing as, especially, like, it does not matter what they say during these hearings. There is no accountability. There is no check. Yeah. The accountability is through the, 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 the presidential, through the, the election of the president. I mean, that's, that's ultimately the accountability because the hearings are, they're a show. They're a, they're a, you know, just a, you know, drama on the stage. Um, a lot of sound and fury, not signifying a whole lot, like a bar from Shakespeare. Um, so I, you know, the, the, the youth of the, of the justices is definitely, I, I was looking at the statistics, and, you know, this is not the first time very young people have been appointed to the court. Maybe that they live longer because of better health care. But, you know, there is, there is a justice that was appointed like 31 or something. I mean, there have been earlier in the republic's history, there have been some, some young ju judges appointed. But in all other, so we're, the center that I run, the Center for Constitutional Design, one of our uh, major kind of pillars of our operation is to think about comparatively what does the U.S. Constitution look like. And if you look around the world at other constitutional courts, you do not see them serving for life. They have a retirement age, they have a term, what have you. And th those can be long enough that you can ensure the independence of the justice without giving them life tenure so that they're, um, you know, Crotchety. I'm sorry. Don't mean that. Sorry. <laughs> That's not what I meant. I meant they've been on there a very, very long time. I do know that there is a story. Of, this is probably apocryphal. I don't know if you about William O. Douglas being so senior and sort of out of it that he was signing his sheet because he, you know, in his hospital bed because he wasn't didn't know what the paper, you know. So sometimes, um, you know, really age is, is an issue in terms of, of functioning on the board. Um, I'm old, so I can. Sorry, I didn't mean to be. And didn't William mean to be Douglas critical. went to school right down this the street here. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yes, women, yeah. exactly. At women, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think these are these are issues, and maybe creating this senior status for justices on the court so that you can bring in new justices on a more regular basis. One of the challenges to all of these reform proposals, though, is the transition process. How do you transition into this? What's the first president you give that that appointment? And what's the first justice you move into senior status? You know, and, and that is hard, hard. So I, I actually think it's the proposals for reform are one thing. It's the transitions once we decide upon a reform, which is going to be a real bone of contention because it's going to it's going to benefit one party over the other. That's your transition plan, unless we can figure out a way to do it even handedly. And that's the hard part. Could you just talk particularly about the content of the Dobbs decision, especially in terms of? The consequences of of using that originalism as any kind of as as a clearly kind of a foundation. Yeah, you know one of the challenges. Yes, I'd be happy to. One of the challenges of of uh, substantive due process, which is the doctrine that um, gave rise to uh, among among a couple of other things too, but but 
gave rise to the right to privacy is that there is embodied in the word liberty in the due process clause, which is otherwise a procedural clause, not a substantive clause. Right? It sets forth that certain things can't be deprived. You can't be, if you're, can't be deprived of life, liberty, or process without due process of law. So the court took that word liberty and started infusing it with substantive rights. And that's a vulnerable position for the court to have taken. Um, and so Alito seized upon that vulnerability to say, well, and look ha back at the, at the precedents that the court had decided that infuse that word liberty with meaning um, to say that we're not going to find any meaning in there unless it is part of the long history and tradition of the United States dating back to, I mean, he went back to the 13th century or something insane. I, I mean, I, but, you know, back to the dawn of the Republic. Um, the problem with the Dobbs decision is that once you take that position, again, this is an originalism in search of a liberal outcome, impossible, because gay marriage, for example, is never going to be found to, have to rest in any basis of the history and tradition of the United States legal system or, or state law or anything else. Um, what Alito tried to do is wave his hands at this problem and say that um, abortion is somehow sui generis, right? Uh, uh, that um, it involves a fetal life and therefore can be distinguished from things like gay marriage. And that is just back to the point about, you know, saying that you're going to follow Roe versus Wade or Pressman or what have you, it's disingenuous because it's unprincipled. Um, so my worry about Dobbs is not necessarily, I mean, the court may not go down the road of overturning all the other precedents uh, that protect privacy and contraception rights and gay marriage and all those things, may not go down that road because of what Alito said in his opinion. But if it chooses not to, if that majority chooses not to, it's doing so in a very, and they're, they're being unprincipled because they have set forth a standard as to how they're going to interpret the word liberty in the Constitution. And the idea that abortion is somehow carved out is, to me, either you're an originalist or you're not. So we got time for one more question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so I agree with all your concerns that about the Supreme Court. Uh, I guess my question is, how do you see the the uh, lower federal courts contributing to this? Because they're mm -hmm. lifetime appointments as well. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the same type of political divisions on those courts. Um, but all the reform efforts are kind of, or at least the ones that you hear a lot about, are all focused on the Supreme Court. Right, of course. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, my bread and butter academic academic work has been in the lower federal courts. And of course, there's so much more moderation there because they serve in panels, they're rotating, they have the check mm -hmm. of the on bond process at the Court of Appeals. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, th those are, that's the source these days of all Supreme Court justices. They're, you know, unlike William O. Douglas, who was on the SEC and, you know, all these other interesting people, Sandra Day O'Connor came from a state court. You know, it's just, they're totally homogeneous. I think this is also a real big problem with the Supreme Court. It means that you all these lengthy, kind of complex opinions with a million footnotes, and that they're, they're even more isolated from the from the public and the way that they write opinions today. Just all kinds of, of negative consequences for having such a homogeneous court. But yes, they 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 are all um, they're not homogeneous, by the way, in terms of background. They're homogeneous uh, in terms of ethnic background or gender. They're homogeneous in terms of their professional backgrounds, and um, so I think that's problematic. Uh, I, I, I just want, in your, your point is well taken, because that's where they come from, and this is where a lot of ideas percolate uh, that ultimately can be uh, advanced by the Supreme Court, depending upon if they prefer those ideas ideologically. There's an interesting phenomenon that's taking place in the lower courts right now that has me particularly worried as well, and that is that, I don't know if you've seen this, there's, there's been a spate of self-concurrences at the Court of Appeals. So judges on three-judge panels are writing the majority opinion, and then they're writing their own self-concurrence. Now, that's a weird thing to do. <laughs> and the reason they're doing it is because they want to, um, they want to uh, highlight to the world their own unique position on things, um, to take to task the en banc court for whatever reasons they have, and it's, and it's uh, hot dogging. And I think, you know, hot dogging, again, that's a deviation from what we consider to be the appropriate judicial role. So, yeah, I have some concerns there. All right. Well, unfortunately, I think our time is up. Uh, before I thank our guests, let me thank, uh, let me remind you, next week, Tuesday, same time, same place, uh, we have our second uh, in our series on the midterm elections. That's uh, 
Kyle Kondik from the University of Virginia will be talking about how, you, how we predict elections and talking about the polling mm -hmm. technology and uh, methodologies. Yeah. Uh, but now, uh, let me thank all of you for coming out today and join thank me in thanking so Stephanie Lindquist. So much fun.